of that and what you see up here, our plane and all of these things are just remnants of the good time that we have this week. We thank you for coming. If you're here uh, through VBS, we're really glad that you came and we appreciate your presence this morning. Uh, we are a church here that uh, uh, just by God's grace uh, trusts in accomplishing the mission of God uh, and the power of God. So we just, uh, we, we really want to just equip the saints of God in the word of God, which is what God has given us. And saints are just people who are born again. We just want to give people that are God's children everything that God has given them from the word of God so that they can be everything God has saved them to be. And if you're here this morning, it's because God has brought you here. Uh, one way or another, uh, in his providence, he wants us to be here this morning, and he wants us uh, to be in his word, and more importantly, he wants to have a relationship with you. And so I do pray that God encourages you this morning from the word of God, and uh, if you have your Bibles, be turning to the book of Romans, and we're going to pick up our time in the Bible. We have just been consistently and, and uh, systematically going through the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 1. This morning we'll be in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21 in our text. And uh, it's been a great week. And I thank everyone that came out this week for uh, VBS and all the work that went in and all the work that uh, we still have to do. So praise the Lord for that opportunity God has given us. As we're turning to Romans chapter 1, I just want to bring up a name that most of you probably would know. I doubt if in this room right now there are many of you, um, if any, that would not know the name <clears throat> James Holmes, right? Uh, how many of you would not know that? James Holmes is the guy, a couple of you don't? Okay, how about the Colorado murders? Anybody not know about that, right? Most of us are aware of that this week. Stop that. And uh, <clears throat> that man, James Holmes, is the crazy guy, the joker, right, that went in uh, uh, the other day and just went crazy inside of a... Um, uh, theater and just started murdering people senselessly. There is no sense in it. There's no reason. There's no rhyme. And now he is forever an infamous, infamous name. Uh, his name will never be uh, the same. And unfortunately, it's a fairly common name. So a lot of people with that name are also, uh, they even this last week were confused with him and it caused some problems. And uh, forever his name is going to be identified as a mass murderer of scores of people in a movie theater in Denver. And it's just a tragedy. And it's shocking. And it's shocking behavior. From what was otherwise, uh, up to that point, considered a young man who was bright, successful, uh, in the world's eyes, a successful young man, uh, and I'm sure his mom and dad would have never uh, imagined uh, that that would be how their child would end up. When he came out of the womb and was a little baby, uh, just like every child, his parents were excited for him, they were looking forward to his future, it was bright, and wow, what a, what a dive bomb from a Ph.D., to a prison sentence, which is, that's grace, frankly. Uh, he needs, well, anyway, we'll get into that. But uh, <clears throat> it's tragic, it's tragic. And uh, this morning, a lot of people are mourning uh, in Denver because of the loss of their family. And it's not just tragic, it's irrational. It's senseless. It's hard to get your mind around those things. And there's no good reason. There's just not a good reason to behave in a wicked way like that. There's just not a good excuse for that kind of thing. Uh, there's not a good reason uh, for breaking people's hearts. And, it, and it is a, it's innocent victims uh, that are left to hold uh, together their lives after the sin has just totally wrecked their lives. So what do you do with that? What do you do with that kind of senselessness? Um, well, you know, there's only one solution, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why this morning we are going to return to the book of Romans. And we're going to start by reading the end, the conclusion of of the text this morning. I want you to look in Romans chapter 1, and I know typically we read a long passage, but this morning we're just going to read verse 32. Romans chapter 1 and verse 32, and then we're going to bite, uh, take bite-sized pieces out of this chapter as we continue through uh, the text this morning. Romans chapter 1 and verse 32, we're going to skip ahead, <clears throat> and, and we're going to look at verse 32. Romans 1 and verse 32, he says, "...who knowing the judgment of God..." that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning, and it is hard to imagine that there are people who take pleasure in death. And yet they do. We've even seen it illustrated this very week. The depravity of man, 
the sinless, uh, the sinful nature of man resides in everyone who was born in Adam's sinful image. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the goodness of God, the grace of God that's revealed through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the time we've spent in the book of Romans as you have highlighted not only Paul's call, but our call to be gospel ministers. As you you have exercised us as a church body, even in the last several weeks, to go forth literally with the gospel, to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would just quicken your word, that you would allow us to see victory in the midst of defeat, that we would see your goodness surpassing the flesh's darkness. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the reality that the gospel is the only solution to man's guilt, and there are no excuses. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus' sufficiency, his blood, his sacrifice, his resurrection, and we thank you for his call even today to every soul in this room to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness to us. We pray you open up this scripture to us today and speak as only you can. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week when we got together, we looked at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, and we saw the revelation of God. We'll be working ourselves this morning through the book of Romans. And I wanted to start here at the end because it highlights the insanity of something like James Holmes, someone who, knowing the judgment of God, would take pleasure in death would commit things that are just so atrocious and not only do it, but have some joy and satisfaction that the whole world is looking on, hoping that he can cause more mayhem, right? Just like the the, uh, insurance commercial. And it's sick and it's wrong, right? But where does that come from? Well, it comes from the depravity that every one of us share. Some of us, and I'll talk about this when I get to chapter 2, think we're better than a guy like James Holmes, but in reality, sin that dwells in us Uh, is able to make us capable of anything. And this morning as we look in in Romans chapter 1, we're going to see not only the revelation of God's wrath as we saw last week, but we're going to see the rejection. But before we do that, I want to remind you where we've been. In verses 18 through 20, we saw that God revealed his love in the gospel. Revelation, or Romans, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 1 and verses 16 through 17. Uh, we saw that God gives us that great love, that great good message that Jesus Christ is, uh, the, God, is, is the way, the truth, and the life. And we saw that Paul, we reminded ourselves that Paul was not ashamed, right? He says, I'm a debtor, I, I'm ready to preach, and I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God. It's the power of, of, uh, of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. So the Apostle Paul was motivated, and he was ready to preach the gospel. And God revealed his wrath in, uh, in verses 18 through 19. He says, Now, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And so there's a revelation of faith in verse 17. And we talk about how the just were... Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the end of verse 17 says, The just shall live by faith. Why? Because the righteousness of, of God is revealed from faith. To faith, And then he turns in verse 18 and says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And as we looked at that, we saw that God revealed his wrath from heaven against all ungodliness. And that is a pattern that was set forth through the scriptures. And I gave you several examples uh, from the Old Testament of God's wrath being revealed from heaven. And then some prophetic instances of as we look forward to when God's wrath will be yet revealed. And I concluded in Second Peter in uh, chapter 3 showing you that, that God's wrath has been revealed already in a flood. That in the middle of that there was a, a moment of grace where God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then the prophecy of a time yet future when this earth will be judged by fire. And God is good for his word. So God reveals his wrath upon those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And we talked about that. And we saw that God removes man's excuses through the revelation and creation and conscience. And that led us up to verse 20. And so as we come to verse 21, I just want to take this portion and read with you verses 21 through 23. Keeping in mind what you see at the end of verse 20, the last little uh, phrase there, so they that they are without excuse. The revelation of God was manifest. His, his, his uh, wrath was manifest in verses 18 and 19. Uh, the invisible things from the creation of God are clearly made seen. Why? So that men are without excuse. 
And we talked a lot about that last week. If you didn't get that, you need to go back and hear that so you can catch up with where we're going this morning. The Bible says here in verse 20, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, what I want you to see this morning is when you think about this point, it's almost absurd. Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 45, he wrote, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou, or thy work? Uh, he hath no hands. It's, it's absurd. The, Isaiah the prophet was saying, How dare the pot tell the maker, right? Um, uh, that he has no business dealing with him, has no business handling him. How, how can the clay say to the one who's forming it that, that you have no bearing on my life? And yet that's really what you see in the book of Romans. As we, we go from this revelation of God's wrath to this rejection of God, uh, we see that, that men, in essence, are doing what, what Isaiah was already prophesying in Isaiah 45 and saying, God, you have no dealings with me. I am my own man. I am my own ship, right? I, I set my own sail, and, and, and I, am, I am my own universe. And that is very much the way the world is today. It's only because of God's grace and mercy that the men even have the capacity to choose anything in this world and go their own way. The foolish sinners reject God's glory. And as we look at this passage, I'm going to give you in this little section uh, several things, several points concerning a foolish sinner because it's foolishness to reject God. That's what the Bible says. The foolish sinners reject God's glory. In verse, verse 1, why? Well, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. See, it, calls them, it says that they have a foolish heart that gets darker. Now, um, you've, I've been here before. As we've come through Romans chapter 1, I believe that verse 21 is a very critical uh, component. Because having an attitude of gratitude, appreciation, an understanding that it is the goodness of God, chapter 2, we'll look at that, that leads men to repentance. It is the goodness of God that allows us to breathe, that God formed us in the womb and he allows us to even be here. It's only because of God that we exist. <clears throat> how foolish it is, how insane it is, how absurd it is to then turn on the creator and deny his existence and deny him. Yet many do that. Why? Well, we're picking up in verse 21. Because, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Now, we're picking up this thought here from the previous verse, as we saw, because they are without excuse. Why do men do that? Why do women do that? Why do we deny God? And, of course, I, 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 you've heard from my own testimony. There's been times in my life that I've denied God. Why? Why are we unthankful? Because we don't want to be accountable. That's what it boils down to. Men do not want to be accountable to anyone other than themselves. They want to be their own God. They want to go their own way. They want to have their own desires. They do not want to be accountable to anyone else. God is witness to this. And, in Rome, and we see that this is a problem that men have intuitively. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Now think about that with me. What's it like to have the understanding that there is a God and then to reject that flatly? Because we saw last week, not only does God reveal himself in creation, but where else does he reveal himself? Anybody remember? It starts with a C. Conscience, right? So we saw that in the text, in Romans, it says it's in them. So God has hardwired us, right? It's just like a computer, right? You turn it on, it has ROM. And, uh, and it's in there, and it's, it's not RAM, it's not, it's not going to go away. It's in there, it's hard-coded in humanity. That we know that there's a God, and He confirms that with creation, so that if you use the brain that God has given you, you understand these things, or, or you choose to reject those things. And, of course, the, the Bible here and the Apostle Paul is teaching us that, 
man, that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Now, I want you to turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis, chapter 45. Genesis is the first book in your Bible. And there's an interesting thing here, which is really a great insight to the heart of God and the mind of God concerning this subject and leads us back to verse 32 that we started with. Genesis chapter 45, and I want you to look at verse 1. Now, this is the account of Joseph. And Joseph was the brother that, the, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, Abra- or that uh, uh, Jacob had that was, was beloved. His brothers were jealous of him because of the visions and the blessings of his father. So he was cast out. And, uh, and uh, they were going to murder him, but they decided not to uh, at the last minute. So then he was then sold to uh, Egyptians who took him into slavery. And uh, he eventually, by the grace of God, was able to uh, ascend to the leadership uh, of the nation of Egypt. He was second command and as uh, in the stead of Pharaoh. He was the one actually operating. Uh, he was the CEO of the nation of Egypt. And so his brothers, who were in a famine, were, uh, were, were seeking help and had gone to Egypt to get relief. And they had no idea that the, this uh, principality that they were dealing with was now their mature uh, brother, uh, and they would have never imagined that this could happen, that their brother would literally be the one running the show in Egypt. I mean, that's just uh, it's, it's unfathomable. Uh, and so because of the wisdom God had given him, by the way, Egypt was able to sustain uh, the, uh, themselves through this famine because God had already given uh, Joseph the insight on what to do and what was coming. That's why he was at the head of the, the nation. And so these brothers come, and, and through a series of events I don't have time to get into, they just kind of, Joseph just kind of un, unravels uh, all of this baggage, all of this history that they had had, and, and, he, and he dealt with some of the, the issues with their brother, and, and some of the issues with the father, and, and he wanted to know if his father was alive, and, and it just all this emotion was, was built up in him. Why? Because he loved his family. He wasn't bitter against them. He wasn't angry with them. He he wanted to reconcile with them because what they meant for evil, he later on says what? God meant for what? Good. God meant for good. And so uh, look at this. uh, uh, Genesis chapter 45 and verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And by the way, this is an incredible picture of what it's going to be for the nation of Israel to finally, after the tribulation period, understand that Jesus Christ uh, is their Messiah. And they will have realized that they actually slew uh, or were part of slaying their own Messiah. And it says in verse 2, And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And verse 3 says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him. For they were, were troubled at his presence. Once they realized that the brother that they had thrown into the hole, that pleaded for his life, the New Testament tells us, that cried for his life, that they sold into slavery, was Pharaoh. You know what they were, they were probably expecting? A death sentence. Romans 13. The powers that be, right? They bear not the sword in vain. The power of life or death was in Joseph's hands. And they'd cre- they had done something that was so grievous that I bet some of them were thinking, that's it for me. I'm done. They were troubled at his presence. Look what Joseph said in verse 4. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. You know what he did? He called for them. Remember what happened to Adam in the garden after he'd sinned? He was hiding in the bushes, right? God called, Adam! Joseph says, come, come near to me. I pray you, I ask you. And they came near. You know, men look out in their dirty, filthy conscience into creation. And they look at their own unrighteousness. And in their heart, they know that they're undone. And they have to make a decision as the, as the voice of God cries out to their conscience, will they draw near to him expecting death? Or do they go their own way? Running from God is about as effective as Joseph's brothers running from him right now. 
you're not going to get very far. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Now, can you imagine this scenario? It's a beautiful story. A great illustration of a picture of Jesus Christ's goodness to us and his willingness to forgive us. Of Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the goodness of God, the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Could you imagine now this story, if, if it was all changed around, and the brother says, no, we deny you. We don't want your goodness. We don't want your grace. And they all went for their sword. Wouldn't that be just crazy? It just doesn't make sense. Why would they do that after he's been so good to them, after he's preserved their life? Beloved, that's what the book of Romans chapter 1 is all about. Because that's the way humanity is. After God has given His only begotten Son, the love of God is so incredible we can't even comprehend it. We don't respond oftentimes like Joseph. We want to go the other way. We don't want to identify with the firstborn among many brethren. We want to go our way and say, no, he's not the Pharaoh, I am. That's how depraved humanity is. That's how wicked we are without Jesus. Listen, if the love of God does not compel you to bow your knee, you are in deep trouble this morning. Joseph says, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. Just as Israel has missed their Messiah, God calls out to them and mankind saying, come near to me through my son Jesus. You may not recognize him, but he's the king of the world. Come to him. Men will not give God the glory he deserves as creator because they do not want to reconcile with his son. They do not want to be accountable to the king. And Jesus Christ is the king. And the closer they draw near to him, the more they understand that they are undone and they must deal with the death sentence. They understand they must, they must, that they justly deserve. Beloved, listen, every one of us is going to give account. And it's going to be for what happened to Jesus on the cross. As you gather up your sins and you measure yourself against yourself, which is unwise, you have totally missed the point that there's only one man who is just and the justifier of sinners. And it's Jesus Christ. Think about how absurd it would be for Joseph's brothers to reject Joseph a second time. It would be unbelievable. Yet many who hear the good news of the gospel turn from God, deny his existence. And you know where they run to? The world. And as they're running around in the world, they think they're getting far away from God. Some of you in this room know what I'm talking about. And you're running from God. You're going from God. You're starving. You're thirsty. You're in a drought in your life. And you think that Jesus is nowhere to be found, and boom, he pops up in your world and says, hey, here I am again. And he's doing that because he wants you to repent while there's time, because the Bible is clear that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. And unless you reconcile with him as your king, you will die in a Christless eternity. That is the truth of God's word. So the sinner has to make a decision. Am I going to harden my heart against God? Or will I acknowledge God in creation? Those who deny that God shaped the void that exists in, in their body, that God-shaped void that we talk about, will also deny the God that created everything and fills the void of the universe. Eternal God, who has just thrown out His handiwork as an example of His power, and his authority. We'll find that rejecting God leads to perdition. As they take the glory of their existence instead of the glory of God and giving it back to him. Foolish sinners. Foolish sinners. Foolish sinners are ungrateful to God's goodness. Men don't appreciate the opportunity to choose when they choose to deny the one who formed them from the dust and breathe in their nostrils the breath of life. We can all identify with the mob mentality. You remember uh, John 19 and verse 6. When the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, Jesus, 
They cried out loud, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. You know, some of us have laughed and and mocked at the Creator's shame, just like a stand-up comic. Or worse yet, like Pilate, we consent to throwing Jesus under the bus when he's the King of kings and and the Lord of lords. We've consented in in a classroom or a workplace to the foolishness because we're either too afraid or too weak spiritually to stand up and be an advocate with an intelligent argument who favors our king. It's a sad situation. The Bible makes it simple and clear. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Psalms 53 also says the same thing. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they and and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. It sounds a lot like the book of Romans, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us measure up. But notice twice they chanted what? Crucify him. Crucify him. It's recorded in your text. They said it twice. Crucify him. Crucify him. And twice in the Old Testament, word for word, it's quoted again. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Just as Israel was ungrateful because they didn't want to receive the creator of their religion or the creator of their nation or the creator of this planet as their Lord, as their King, as their Messiah. They acted foolishly in denying him, just as men do today, in denying him as their Lord and Savior. Foolish sinners cannot see the foolishness of faithlessness. Look at verse 21 back in our text, Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain, empty in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This text goes on to say that they became vain. They became empty in their imaginations. Men who reject God have an empty imagination because God is the only one designed to fill up the void. Just keep your finger here in Romans because we'll be back. And go back to Genesis. I want you to see this real quick. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6 and verse 5. It's not an unfamiliar area of your Bible. First book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. As God came and looked upon the activities of men, it says in verse 5 of Genesis 6, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every, here it comes, imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Just like Romans 1 and verse 21 says, they, they became vain in their imaginations. Their imaginations were void of God. And when our imagination is void of God, the things that fill it up are simply dark and darkness. The first 2,000 years of history conclude with a flood. The wrath of God, as we talked about last week, was poured out Why? Because men's foolish hearts were darkened. They were vain. Their imaginations were vain and empty. 2,000 years go by. What happens? Jesus Christ is on the cross. Literally, the wrath of God for all of humanity is poured out upon him on three hours. Why? Because the, the imagination of men's heart is only evil continually. Without Jesus Christ, we're void. Fast forward the tape 2,000 years. What's going to happen next? There's a man coming, and he's going to, you know what he's going to do? He's going to make you worship. If you're not saved and you're here during the tribulation period, believe me, remember this. He is going to make you worship his image. And he's going to try to create a system that tries to replace God. And you know what? Men who will not reconcile with God are going to go hook, line, and sinker for it. They're going to love it. And you know what's going to happen next is the wrath of God that we read about last year or last week will come in full force and fall upon those who did not receive 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 the love of the truth. 
their foolish heart was darkened. As men search for enlightenment that excludes God, he finds his foolish attempts to only lead him further into darkness. Nietzsche can declare that God is dead, but the human soul cries out, I'm still here. God may be dead, but what about me? You may become a Buddhist or a Hindu, and you may try to go into some, uh, some state of, 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 uh, of unconsciousness and deny the existence of, of what appears to be the temporal, but only the temporal is only here to show you the eternal. And it's a loop that you cannot get out of. Why? Because God is programmed in your heart to know that there is a creator and he is calling after you to acknowledge him, to submit to him, to receive his love so that you can have love to give because this world is dark and that's where you all come in, beloved. This is a message that's critical to us as Christians because we have the good news and it is the only thing that's going to fill the hearts of men. Don't let the Royal Stadium or the, or the, or the Arrowhead Stadium fool you. Just because people jump up and scream and they yell and they have a temporary moment of happiness, which I like to participate in, <laughs> that doesn't mean that they're filled up inside. When they leave the parking lot, after it's all over, they're as empty as they, le- as they came. Because they can only get joy from the happenings of this life. There's nothing eternal. There's nothing that is going to fill up the emptiness inside. That emptiness is designed to be filled not with darkness, but the light of God's word. Buddha can say that you don't exist, but the soul of man cannot attain nothingness. Believe me, I've tried that when I was lost. But his origin was birthed from the mind of God. He knows that there's more. He knows that there's more, that that he cannot suppress the fact that there is a creator. The further he slides into the abyss of darkness, that will eventually be illuminated by the flames of hell. There are men today looking for illumination. They're looking everywhere but in the Word of God. They're looking everywhere but in the conscience and the creation that God has put forth. And beloved, my fear is that they will be illuminated. But by the time they wake up, it's going to be too late. Foolish sinners can't destroy God. So they attempt to change Him. Look in verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise. You need to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I don't have time this morning. It's all laid out there. They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They profess themselves to be wise, but they're really fools. God's even done a funny on us here in the Greek language. The the Greek word for fool here is is merino, which comes from the, the English word that we've now transliterated out of that Greek called Moron. They become morons. Your professor at college is supposed to be wise, right? But be careful. If he doesn't line up with God's mind, the scripture calls him a fool, a certified moron. Now, some of the most brilliant minds of our time profess themselves to be wise while revealing that in reality they are simple fools. Noted scholar and author and journalist Christopher Hitchens, who I actually listened to, enjoyed hearing his uh, debates and different things. He, he's a fascinating guy. Uh, he recently uh, left the earth not too long ago to face a Christless eternity if he held the position that he publicly espoused. He wrote the book, God is Not Great, in an attempt to dismiss religion altogether. The foundation of his argument against God and therefore organized religion based in the premise that, there was, uh, that uh, creation was not scientifically possible or that the creator was not scientifically possible, therefore he wasn't divine, so he had no scientific evidence to confirm the assumption that there was a God. And the preponderance of the evidence notwithstanding, Christopher Hitchens, as brilliant, brilliant as he was, is now one of the leading proponents. You want, I didn't need to announce that. Maybe, is CNN here today? I need to tell everybody the news. Let's put this out. Christopher Hitchens is now a believer. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, based on the pattern I've seen in Scripture, when men wake up in hell, the first thing they want to do is come back and proclaim the goodness of God. It's what Luke 16 says. He knows the truth now. Why? Because, because this morning, he, if he could, would plead from hell for your souls. And he would tell you that, no, it is true. The record is right. And he would want to share with you the good news. Why? Because the rich man in Luke 16 wanted to do the same thing. Once he tasted his first moments in hell. 
They were illuminated, all right, with the flames of hell. Beloved, we need our illumination to come from the goodness of God's word. We need to not reject the creator, but yet men do. They don't believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, or the life. So be gracious with the ignorant. Be careful with your high school or your college professor who belittle you for your biblical worldview. World and they surmise, oh, you're just, a, you're just a young earth creationist. They don't even take the time to examine the Bible. They don't even understand the fall of Satan. They don't understand the judgment of God in, in Genesis and how all of those things together would bring their scientific thesis together in a perfect, in a, in a perfect unison. And even when there are intelligent men and men of their stature that, that are equal and their peers and they, and they listen to their arguments, they, they reject those out of hand as though they can't be true. Why? Because they, they come from theology. Listen, there would be no science if God didn't allow it. They do all of that without taking or examining the Word of God seriously for one moment. I've, and I've met them. I've met some of you young people. You go off to college and, and you didn't, for whatever reason, you didn't get a good foundational understanding of the Word of God in your home or in this church. And then you come back after you went through your science course. And all of a sudden you think you know everything about Genesis 1 through 12 and that it's just a fable. But look, listen to me. You better get in that book and study it because you don't know anything. This book is deep. It's not just a cunningly devised fable. And I know I make people uncomfortable when I talk about the Bible as though it's equal or better than science. I can tell you what altar you worship at. And we worship at two different altars. Beloved, I'm going, I'm going to heaven on this thing. With all my heart, I believe it. Pray for them that waste their, their incredible intellect chasing their tail through the easily identifiable fable that they call evolution. Evolution. In its broadest sense, it defies the laws of science and physics and takes more faith to believe than the biblical record itself. I pray for men like Dr. Stephen Hawking who continue to distance themselves further and further from a personal God. On my blog, you can find this. I put it up about a year ago or so, but I, just, I pulled it back out for this sermon. It just fascinated me. I'll just read it to you. Dr. Stephen W. Hawking, former Caucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge University today, made explicit his rejection of God and suggests that the laws of physics do allow the universe to have created itself from nothing. What? Isn't the opposite? Every action has an opposite and equal? Yeah, I don't know how that works. In the latest book, ironically titled The Grand Design, Hawkins states, according to Reuters and the London Daily Telegraph, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason that there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist. I'm like, really? <laughs> this declaration by Hawking and the, uh, and the American co-author Leonard uh, Mladenow is, is a sharp departure from his earlier assessment of the possible secrets of the origin, a brief history of time, and a work in which he said, if we discover a complete theory... It would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we should know the mind of God. You see how he slid? There was a time in his life when he was publicly saying, if we can do science really well and we can come up with the right thesis and we can come up with the right theory, we will know the mind of God, giving some consent that there could be a divine creator. But after turning and turning and turning, he finally comes to the point and uses this absurd uh, notion that because there's gravity, that everything can just poof. Well, he's right because God is the one to create something <laughs> out of nothing. Romans 9 and verse 20 says, Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made thus? Harkening back to what we read in Isaiah at the beginning of the service. My beloved, my point of bringing these things up is not to belittle very intelligent men that are learned and have a lot of good things to offer. I, I'm not against all that. Uh, science is good, just not science falsely so called. It's simply to point out that the most intelligent among humanity become fools when they reject the light of God and themselves demonstrate the depravity 
of the human conscience. Like Noah waiting on the rain to justify why he built the ark. Beloved, what we must, und- what we must understand is that God has given us his word. And our job is not to worry about convincing Stephen Hawkins if he, or Christopher Hitchens uh, about Jesus Christ. They've already studied the argument. They've already made their decisions. That's fine. That's where they'll, they'll live and they'll die with those things. I hope, they, I hope men like that repent before it's too late. But, beloved, our job is to hold fast to the faithful words we've been taught because I'm telling you, in due time, it will come to pass. And if we really love people, we will tell them about the love of God and the people whose hearts are sensitive to what God has put in them and what he has put around them will, but will, will eventually get honest and come into the accountability of what they have done to Jesus Christ on their cross. They will bow their knee and confess with their heart that he is Lord to the glory of God and the glory will go back where it belongs upon him. Pride is at the core of this. Notice the corruptible images that, that God is, is changed into in Romans 1.23. The glory of God is changed into these corruptible images. And these images are, are very clear to see. They're, they're that of a man and a bird and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Foolish men prefer to worship those things. From Santa Claus to sports figures... Alexander the Great to Chairman Mao, men looked to men as deities. The ancient Greeks worshipped the intellect of man and the human body. Birds, from Thanksgiving to pagan religion, we place, we place Thanksgiving to God uh, <clears throat> and the fowl of the air below. Uh, we place Thanksgiving to God below that of the fowl of the air oftentimes. The ancient Assyrians bowed down literally and worshipped birds. Four-footed beasts from the Easter bunny to your NFL fantasy football mascot, we get more excited about four-footed beasts than we do about the Lord Jesus Christ who created them. The Egyptians looked to cows and to crocodiles as the Hindus do even today. Creeping things, from Halloween to Darwin's origin of the species, we cannot overlook the reptile. Of course, we cannot have a good time without Halloween and the creepy crawlies, but many hundreds of dollars spent on on uh, serpent images, right? And, and all these things that, that uh, rotate around a universal image of paganism it's becoming ever impo- popular. Why? Because the serpent in pagan circles represents the creature that's necessary for rebirth. And why might that be? Well, I believe it's much deeper than that. Because when you go to Ezekiel chapter, five, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, you're going to see a picture, of the, uh, not a picture, an image of the throne of God. And what you're going to see around the throne of God are cherubims. And these cherubims all have four faces, one like a man, one like a lion, one like an ox, and one like an eagle. So you have a man, you have four-footed beasts, and you have an eagle. You have a, a wing thing. But what happened to the reptile, the creeping thing? Well, he's not there, is he? That would be Satan. You see the degeneration? It goes from man to beast right on down to the creeping thing. Actually, man to bird to beast to creeping things. The man of sin is coming. He is the Antichrist. And he fakes, he's going to fake the authority of God, the line of the tribe of Judah, as he is simply a cheap knockoff, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. To this day, he has people all over the world believing that a four-footed beast, a cow, is their God. And beloved, he's an angel of light, but he's no light at all. So what about those creeping things? Well, Satan desires to degenerate man to his level because Satan has fallen. He wants you to fall down in the dirt with him. And don't let that happen. Lost, depraved sinners will end up worshiping the serpent, that devil, the son of perdition, not many days hence. And in doing so, humanity will stoop to an all-time low and bring upon it the wrath that makes the flood of Genesis look like the mercy of God. And I know those are sober words, and that's not very exciting. We just came off of EBS. Trust God. Hey, beloved, that's exactly the point. The only way to get through this storm is through Jesus Christ. We see in Genesis 1, verses 21 through 23, that man is on a steady decline, not an incline. Men and societies alike do not reach their potential outside of Christ. Before they collapse under their own depravity of their own weight, before Adam's fall at the beginning of Noah, Noah's generation, all generations begin with monotheism. 
We know that because that's how they started after they got off the ark. This is the opposite of evolution. It reveals the decay and the depravity of men. If it were not for Christ entering the human race 2,000 years ago and his spirit descending upon the church in Acts chapter 2, the human race would not have made it as far as it has to this day. Humanity has no hope outside of Christ. There is a steady decline that is manifest in the remainder of Romans 1 that is very evident to see. No guilt, no gospel, no excuses. It's a hard saying, isn't it? But that's the reality of the scripture. Without Christ, there would be no hope. Look down in verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up. It gets so bad that God says, I quit. He gives them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. Here it comes again, verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat, meaning that they were, it's homosexual behavior. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, God gives up again, to do those things which are not convenient. They're not even natural. But being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Exactly what we saw this week in Colorado. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they don't only know that, not only do the same, But they have pleasure in them that do them. Listen, beloved, I want to just take a few more moments and just discuss the results of sin. There's the revelation of God in his wrath from the heavens. There is the rejection of God. But you know what God lists out for us here? The results. You'll oftentimes hear people come into this passage and talk about homosexuality being an abomination and all of that, which is certainly, uh, it's certainly true. But the reality, what God is pointing out in Romans chapter 1, is, is that is not the problem. That is the evident manifestation of a society that has already gone wrong. A society that cannot take a sermon like I'm preaching and swallow it down their throat because they think you're a crazy man. It's, it's too politically incorrect to believe that there is truly a God in heaven and he has ordered the way that humans should operate. Even humans that deny him would understand this. But, beloved, that's where we live today. God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, it says. Wherefore, because of that de-evolution, de- de- uh, de- man's depravity causes God to give up and allow the unregenerate man to have his own way and swim in his own mess. That's what you see from verses 24 through 31. You see God saying, okay, three times, I will give you up. I will give you what up. I will give you up. You know what he's doing? He's saying, you want this prayer? You can have it. You want to drive off the cliff? I will remove the barrier. He's warning them. He's got the flashing sign saying, don't go there. I've revealed from heaven what happens throughout the course of history. This is not new to creation. This has happened in every, every, uh, in every uh, civilization throughout history. There has been a Genesis account. There is a flood account. I want the scientists to bring that up. What well, they do? They call it an ice age. It starts in the heart starts in the heart would you guard your heart guys this is relevant to us because this this epistle is written to who the believers at rome called to be saints this epistle is written to us that we might understand the gospel that we might understand our place that we don't let our children go off into depravity and stand by idly like lot as his family got flushed down the toilet by the very same behavior of a society that was degenerate and rejected god Guys, I'm here. As a, I'm saved. I know this. I'm saved. I'm born again to be a change agent. I am not here to just wait till Jesus comes. I am here to go forward walking in wisdom toward those that are without because they need Jesus in their heart. 
And that is why you're here as well if you're born again. That is your mission. Why? Because men's heart need Jesus. They, we don't have a heart unless we have the heart of God. We don't know how to love unless God puts it in us. And so we must have a heart, and we must not lose heart. The King Solomon, I don't have time to read it this morning, but go back to uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 11 and read it this afternoon. 1 Kings chapter 11. You know what happened to Solomon? Solomon allowed his heart to be stolen away by idolatry. It literally says the same thing that it says in Romans, man. He, his, his heart was taken into captivity as he worshipped uh, too many wives, too many women. You men, you, you know what you do, some of you? You're off surfing the internet. You know what? You're losing your heart and you're losing your family. You're enjoying the things that are done in them. And you don't know the consequences are grievous upon your kids and the generation and your neighborhood and your community. Beloved, take this stuff seriously. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. This is very practical. As God's word speaks to how the depravity of the heart results in the first evidence of depravity and, and lewd fornication, where he moves uh, from, someone would move from one partner to another partner, unchaste, hardening their heart and ignoring the proper confines of the sexual relationship designed in marriage. And move just from, from spot to spot. You know what, do, we know what, what animals do that? Dogs do that. God didn't create men and women to be acting like that. He created us to be with a partner that represents Christ in the church. Now as soon as I say that, I, I know I'm talking to a group of folk that many of us are guilty. But praise God for His grace. He didn't create you for that. If you were to place a death gauge on the depravity of a nation like the United States, you could easily say we reached this first stage in the 1960s. Wouldn't America lose its heart about the time sex, drugs, and rock and roll replaced the nuclear family in pop culture? Romans 125 came to, came to light from the generation born from 1946 to 1964, known as the consumer culture. We embraced the me generation that was born and the United States was not seen as a great, has not seen uh, such a great rival since that time. You know, the 1960s closed with the fitting cap, as Anton LaVey wrote in 1969, the Satanic Bible. Hallelujah. Where were the preachers? Beloved, there were preachers, and there are preachers. I'm just telling you guys, that's, that's, the, human, that's the human heart. God gave them up into vile affections, verse 26 says. You don't need to be a Bible scholar to figure out the context of what we're discussing here in this next section. He gave them over to do those things which are not convenient. A new enlightenment, but an old depravity that open, openly reveals the wickedness of man's mind. When I was a boy, the term gay was popularized. I can still remember sitting in the second grade when a kid said gay and another kid didn't know what he meant. And then there was a big ch a snicker going on because we were all just discovering what that term meant. Boy, how did I, what I have ever known, where that was all going. A student of the scripture will understand that it, it's a natural decline to a militant and heartless path that appears in Judges 19 and verse 22, and also 19, verse 5 of Genesis. It's amazing, those two stories. You line them up, you go back to Judges chapter 19 and verse 22, you see militant homosexuals knocking on someone's door, trying to, to pull a man out into the street. And literally the owner of the house says the same thing that, it, that, that the, uh, the previous uh, uh, story in Genesis 19 says, when the, when the angels of God literally were in Sodom and hom militant homosexual males from all over the city, and the Bible says all ages came to the door and were beating on the door trying to pull the angels out. You know who was sacrificed? Yeah, you better believe it. Young girls were sacrificed. Women. Men got to the place where they were so selfish, so self-centered, so perverted that they're willing to stomp all over what God designed to be his church in order to fulfill their own lust. And it gets so upside down and backwards, it's unbelievable. It's so perverse. It's a harsh reality that wickedness of men, their depravity, finds men who will sacrifice those uh, that, that they are to protect for a mob mentality of perverts. 
And that's even happening today in politics. Beloved, let me tell you something. There are men and women that will sell your family and my family down the river. Why? Because there's a mob mentality of perverts. I can remember sitting in my car listening to James Dobson in the 80s. And I'm not angry, guys. Believe me. I know it may sound like I am. I'm not. I'm concerned. He's on the radio talking about homosexual behavior is a zero-sum game. And, uh, you know, we got to stop this influence because our society society's embraced this depravity and it's going to be normalized in our culture. They're going to be teaching it in the schools. I, I, honestly, I sit in there in my car going, come on, James Dobson, you're crazy. Man, everyone I know makes fun of homosexuals. I got a cousin that's a homosexual. You know, we make fun of him, lighting the loafers, blah, blah, blah. Little did I know. Now, if you're a homosexual, let me tell you, you're not a homosexual. You're engaging in homosexual behavior. You're just, just like the rest of us. You have a sin problem that can be repented of and God can heal you. It's not the homosexuality that I'm really beating up on here. Guys, what I'm pointing out here is the depravity. When good is called evil and evil is called good. And for some reason, we walk around as though it doesn't happen, and we, and we don't know the answers, and we've got the answers in front of us. It is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the love of God. In 1 Kings 14, 24, God notes that the nations indwelling the promised land were sodomites, and he removed them from the land. Today, we elect sodomites to the highest places of government and celebrate their perversion as though it's something to be proud of instead of offering them help. And you, know, and you guys know as well as I say that right now, in the mainstream media anyway, I would be labeled some fanatic because that is literally what the Bible teaches and also what science uh, or, or medical science would at least confirm as well. That is not healthy. You want to die young? Live in a homosexual lifestyle. You want to be unfulfilled in your relationships? Live a homosexual lifestyle. You're going to have more partners. You're going to have more health problems. And if you're a male, you're going to die younger statistically. That's the facts. Beloved, I bring this up because I'm telling you, gay pride will eventually become militant homosexuality if the pattern of Scripture continues to hold true. What is that? Is that the problem? No, no. That's the symptom. That's just the symptom. It's not the problem. I want all your young people to know that when you go to school and college, that the homosexual advocates uh, tell you that homosexuality is natural and normal and, and that you can't pass judgment. In a sense, they are correct. It is natural when you reject God to have that lifestyle of perversion. So if you want to stay in the natural, man, you will, you will probably experience that kind of tendency, especially as it's promoted more and more among our society. But if you want to walk in the Spirit, you know what? God will give you a supernatural ability to, to, to walk in His ways. And by the way, as we, before I get there, that goes for all of us fornicators as well. It's interesting how sinners like to pick up rocks and throw them at other sinners. But do you know what the point is? We're all depraved without Jesus Christ. That's the point. But you can see some landmarks. God gave them up, verse 28, to a reprobate mind. It went from a heart to an affection to the mind. They gave up the heart. God gave up the heart. God gave up their vile affection and lastly, he says, man, I, I had to give him up to a reprobate mind. And you guys can read the text. Eventually, God allows those who insist in walking in darkness to believe that they indeed are enlightened because of the hardness of their heart. And along with that comes a long list of behavioral disorders that we can clearly see on display. All unrighteousness includes fornication, which is just sexual sin in general. Wickedness, self which is self-explanatory. Covetousness, which is defined as idolatry in Colossians 3.5. Maliciousness, which is con congealed anger. Envy, discontent with another's possessions or advantage, a big tool in the political theater today. Murder, we see this in Colorado this week. Debate, contention and strife, a deliberate attempt to, to uh, deceive. Deceit, a, a snare. Malignity, ill will and cruel ways. Whispers, secret slanderers, backbiters, open slandering. Haters of God. By the way, it's the sixth of God in this passage. And it comes after Romans 1.25 when men change the truth of God. They become haters of God who are fearless of the judgment of God in verse 32. Despiteful. They despise and, and, and are insulted and insult others. 
proud, one who swaggers. You see anyone swaggering? Uh, not Jimmy Swagger. Boasters. Anyone watches wa- watching a sport event lately? You see anyone uh, boasting? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm the man. It's in our culture. That's why I like Marcus Allen, right? He hands the football and just keeps it going. Proud. Boasters. Evil inventors. Anyone check out the video games lately? Disobedient to parents. Punishable by death in the Old Testament. It was so serious. Without understanding... Read Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. See how a Gentile walks. Covenant breakers, without natural affection. You remember the Pharisees, the religious guys walking by? The guys on the side of the road? Nobody would cross the street. There's images today that you can find on YouTube. People, Someone gets, gets injured and people just walk on by. Where's the good Samaritan without natural affection? You can't get involved. You might get a lawsuit. Litigation, implacable, unable to be satisfied, unmerciful, showing no compassion, like the concubine that died at the hands of her perverted abusers and judges. The pervasiveness of perversion is unmerciful, and its destruction of innocence and goodness is incomprehensible. So, man, Brian, what do we do? You got me done depressed right now. You know what? God gave Jesus... This is the good news. Look at this in verse 32, and then we're going to wrap it up. Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of, here comes, death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Proverbs 8.36 says, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. As you look at this chapter and you see on full display the depravity of man, the fact that there is no real reason why God would even even mess with humanity. If if all of these lists were committed against you, if you had a relative in the in Colorado this week that was shot dead by this crazy gunman, would you want to go redeem that crazy gunman? Or would you want to see justice executed swiftly at the end of a sword, probably? Most of us would rather go for the the last answer, right? But you know how good God is? You know how good God is? There's many that even after hearing this long sermon, this is what they're going to say about the preacher. He hates homosexuals. He hates all this. He hates... Listen, beloved, this church is filled, all of us, if we're honest, that list, probably one of our life, collectively, touches every one of those things in this room including the the deepest benchmarks of depravity. So what makes up the difference? I'll tell you what makes up the difference. Is you're not going to be judged for all of that. Jesus was. Which brings me back to the beginning. We deserve that. We deserve to be cast out. We deserve to be standing before King Jesus with our knees knocking, ready for a sword to lop off our head. You know what you're going to be judged for? What you do with the goodness of God when you understand it right now. Are you going to run from him? Are you going to cling to him? Paul preaching in Acts chapter 17, he preaches before this crowd of of men of knowledge and intellect. You know what? There were three responses. Some claved to Paul. In the gospel, some would hear it again. You know what others did? They rejected it and went further into depravity. Beloved, there's going to be a great white throne judgment. And there'll be people judged for their works. You know what their works are going to be weighed against? Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God. And they're going to be found wanting. They may not, they may not believe in God today or deny. They, may, they don't really, It's not they don't believe. They deny him today. But beloved, they aren't going to deny him in that day. When he reveals himself to them and says, Hey, listen, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Why did you reject it? 
because he is the standard for righteousness. I know I'm getting ahead in the text. I'll get there in Romans 3 and 4 and go on down, but I want to get there today because I don't want to leave anybody this morning in depravity. It's possible that God has brought you here today and you know in your heart that, that you are this list, that you are, you, and you even know you're in darkness. I don't want to leave you there. You're guilty. There, there is a gospel. So, so the issue isn't, no, no, is, isn't the guilt, the gospel, and no excuses. It's what's your excuse for not receiving the gospel and staying guilty. When you know that Jesus Christ is so good that he took your place so you wouldn't have to face the charges against you. Why in the world would anybody reject that kind of love? Beloved, today is the day of salvation. Time is the benchmark. And we can pick on Christopher Hitchens or we can pick on uh, uh, Richard Dawkins or one of these guys. You know, they're easy to pick on. I appreciate the fact that they're at least intellectually honest and put their thoughts out in writing and we can all pick on them. That's nice. But you know what? There's going to be people that hear this sermon and inside their heart they got to make a choice. Guys, I'm telling you, I'm your preacher. I can't make the cut off of that list. If, I, if I'm held accountable for everything in Romans 1, I'm, I'm in trouble. But Jesus was held accountable for me. <laughs> That's how, now think about Joseph again. How much does God love you? How much does this creator love you? Not, not only did he show you in creation, not only did he put it in your conscience, but he brought forth Jesus, the Christ, to literally pay for your sins so you would not have to face his just, righteous anger because he is so just and so right. He is not at all intimidated by your argument. He is not scared of you. He is not moved. As a matter of fact, he sees you in so much pity that if it wasn't for his own movement from heaven to come down and be your advocate, he knows that you don't stand a chance against his righteousness and does everything in his ability to make it clear that he loves you, so why? You can love him back. So don't go out of here calling me a hater. Or you can call me a hater. It doesn't matter. But listen to me. Jesus Christ loves you. And I love you, whether you believe it or not. You think I'm your enemy because I speak the truth? Hey, listen. Jesus loves you. Repent today while you have time. Because this is, this is it, guys. This is the time. Today is the day of salvation. If you're saved today, man, take a deep breath. <sighs> Isn't it nice? Isn't the grace of God awesome? Love your God. Serve him. Be like those brothers in Genesis, man. And go forth and get your inheritance for his glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you for uh, just uh, giving us relief from our own depravity through Jesus Christ. It's such a shame, Heavenly Father, that, that we forced you to show us your love in such a remarkable way. But Lord, it's such an incredible gift that we cannot deny that we, it deserves exaltation, not only in time, but for all of eternity. Lord, I pray in this very moment that, that there would be men and women, even under the sound of my voice, that would face their fear of being held accountable to God and understand that he is, is calling them right now to draw closer not to chop their head off in judgment, but to tell them they're forgiven. And Heavenly Father, for that one that mocks God, who laughs at the word of God, who takes light the word of God, Lord, I pray that they repent before the great white throne judgment, before they take their last breath, for time is short. Lord, I pray we would do our part to proclaim your goodness in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts so you be glorified. With eyes, heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around this morning, if you're one that would say, Brian, I'm telling you, my bell's being rung today. I, I know God is calling me. I'm, I'm kind of scared even. I, I, I don't know. I, I know I need to get right with him. I don't even know exactly how, but I want to... I want to draw near. I know he's calling me. I want to be right with him. If, if that's you today, would you just raise your hand right where you're at? Amen. 
Anyone else? Just say, hey, that's me. I need to be right with him today. Maybe you need to be saved. We have one brave person, so that's me. Anyone else? I'm not trying to manipulate anybody or anything like that, but if, if you do, if you, if you need some prayer this morning, just, just raise your hand right where you're at. You can put it down, but I, I've seen one person. Anyone else? Say, Brian, that's me. I preach this sermon to people who are saved. Can that be? Why would God tell us that this morning? What's he wanting us to remember? I'll tell you what he's wanting you to remember, brethren. That we're the salt and the light. And we make up the difference. God loves you. Can you love a homosexual? God does. I'm not saying you consent to perversion or you wallow in the mire with the pigs, but how's your heart? Do you love him this morning? Are you an idolater? Are you worshiping other than him, something other than him? Is your heart like Solomon being filled up with things that are drawing it away? Well, as I was preparing this sermon, I was convicted. I can totally see that just in the culture we live, in my own life. It's so easy to be drawn away and be unthankful. And the next thing you are, you're unholy. And you start to see, even in your Christian walk, the remnant of that old crusty man creep in. Hey, beloved, I would encourage you, if that's you today, repent. Get back in, in, in your stead with God. Why? Because this world needs your light so desperately. Deny yourself. Forget the me generation and make it the him generation. Let's stand. We don't have Matt this morning, so this is what we're going to do. We're just going to close in a word of prayer. This morning, if you're one that, that needs to make a decision, as we conclude, I just want to invite you uh, to, fi- to seek me out. Maybe you're a Christian and you have some problems. Maybe you're, you're a non-believer. You're someone that's just now wanting to see more evidence. You're wanting to really get into this Bible. Maybe you want to challenge me. You want to sit down at my table and debate me over some of these points. Hey, may, that is fine. After we're done, I'll be in the foyer. I'll be happy to talk to you. I'd love to meet with you and, and just take and, and walk through some of these things. If you need to work through them. Maybe you need something more practical in your life. You need to be discipled. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you just need to follow the Lord in obedience. Whatever it is, uh, we are here to help you. So I encourage you to take that next step in your life. We're not going to have a traditional altar call this morning. I ask you to move your feet and find me, find Jim, find Randy, find one of the pastors, find someone who is shining the light of Jesus in this church, and we will help direct you where you need to go. But don't leave here today without making a decision because any decision you don't make is a decision you just made. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for even the hard words that you give us. You give those to us. Why? Because you love us. You love us enough to speak the truth. And this is not an easy sermon for me to preach. But Lord, I want to be honest with your word. I want want people to understand your righteousness and your holiness. And man's utter depravity without Jesus Christ, our advocate, our propitiation. There's only one way. There's only one good news, and it's through Jesus. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. I pray that we would not be ashamed as we go forth, that we would be at your disposal this week, that we would uh, be ready with our mind to give an answer. And Lord, that we would be unashamed of the word of God as we go forth this week, Lord, that we would even run into those who mock and make light of of who you are and that we would rejoice in knowing, Lord, that that we are saved and and pray for those that are so hard-hearted, knowing if it wasn't for the grace of God, that's where we would be ourselves. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that you give us a heart this week to reach people. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.